Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, it does take a couple of minutes for such big numbers to, to gain entry. We've got about a thousand people joining us today. So uh, just while we wait for everyone to enter the webinar, we'd just like to start off by asking you to share your thoughts in the chat box on, on the following question that's on your screen now. So what, uh, what was your favorite moment, your favorite memory in PE when you were a child? Uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes to, to write your answer in the chat box and have a look at other people's memories and then we'll make a start and introduce the webinar once everyone's in. So again, just for those just joining us, if you could uh, just start by dropping your favourite memories, uh, your favourite moments of PE when you were a child, just while we wait for everyone to enter the webinar. Thank you to those contributing their ideas so far. Lots coming in. Great to see. Good afternoon, everybody. We will make a start. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I appreciate you taking your time out during this uh, difficult time to join us, and hopefully we'll make this hour really productive for you. Just to let you know, we will be finished in time for the chase, so anybody who's a big fan of that will be, will be done for five o'clock, so uh, don't, don't worry about that. Just a quick introduction. My name is Paul Quinn. I am uh, work for the FA. I was a teacher for 13 years, and my region is Yorkshire and Derbyshire, so I work across schools, universities and football clubs across the Yorkshire and Derbyshire region. And I'm delighted to join this afternoon to talk about a topic that is really sort of a, a pivotal to high quality PE in terms of engaging pupils. So hopefully you can get as much out of it as you possibly can this afternoon. So I'll just let three other colleagues introduce themselves and then we'll get straight into the content. Yeah, good afternoon. And just to reiterate what Paul said, many thanks again for joining us for, for the second in this series of webinars. Uh, we tr we truly, as as a PE unit, have been overwhelmed by the the engagement with this. Like I said, we had a, a thousand signed up uh, well in advance of this uh, webinar today. So thank you so much for your support and uh, in, in what we're doing. Um, for those who weren't with us last week, um, my name is Ryan Davies. I'm the the FAP coordinator for the Northeast. Uh, we even got a bit of sun up here, th here this afternoon. So uh, a great day, and uh, it's a pleasure to be working with you all. Uh, and hopefully. Uh, this webinar is an opportunity to collaborate and share some experiences on the topic of engaging pupils in PE. Myself and Paul will be the leading today's this session, but we're also fortunate to be joined by Chris Welburn and Mark Carter, also of the FAP unit, who will be monitoring things in the background and having discussions around your questions at points during the workshop. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Kelly, uh, who's in the background working. Uh, on the technical side of things to ensure that everything runs smoothly this afternoon. Just before we get into the webinar, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you should be uh, being placed on mute with your camera off uh, as you came into the webinar. Uh, if we could just make sure we keep that just so it keeps the, the call quality as best it can. Uh, we're recording the workshop just so we can make it available to a wider audience for those people who weren't able to join us live. Uh, if you could use the chat box as you have been doing so far uh, to answer questions or, or pose any questions, uh, obviously being respectful and, and using professional language, which I, I'm sure we will. And the, the presentation slides, as well as some other handouts and your certificate of attendance will be available to download at the end of the workshop. Uh, it's going to be a mixture of uh, interaction and ourselves present some stuff and question and answer uh, over the next hour or so. Okay, so just three real questions to pose for you. 
we've all been on CPD events, we've all been at training events, and I think we just want to try and keep these three questions at the forefront, really, as we're going through the content. So we're hoping there's some things that we discuss that helps you confirm some things that you're doing in your schools and in your practice at the moment, or sorry, before this was happening, and hopefully when we get back to some form of normality. We're, fingers crossed we can challenge a few things as well. So, you know, start provoking some thoughts, start provoking some discussion around what is best practice in terms of pupil engagement. And obviously the chat box is a great opportunity for you to share your thoughts around that as well. And then fingers crossed as well, we, we make you curious about something, a little bit of a health warning with any webinar. We've only got up to an hour, so content is limited. We're not going to bamboozle you too much. We want, we want to give you a chance to digest some of the things we go through, but hopefully we give you opportunity to be curious about a few things and go away and, and investigate those. And like I said, when we get back to some normality, hopefully try some of these things out in your environments as well. So in terms of what we can influence, really, we want to focus on this top box in terms of pupil engagement. I think we need to be realistic. There are a lot of external influences that pupils come into our settings with. That might be socioeconomic, that might be parental support, that might be interest in the activities, um, personal bias, whatever that might be. There might be certain factors in your school. So for example, the school I went to as a child, I can remember vividly, the facilities was a big issue when I was at secondary school in particular. And sometimes, you know, there was 40 or 50 kids in a small space. But one thing I do remember from those times was that the teacher still managed to engage with us. The teacher still managed to make that positive experience as possible. So there are lots of external influences, but we're going to be thinking about today and the mindset really want it to be around what we can influence as professionals and practitioners in our environment. We all come from different settings. All our schools and, and uh, places of work are very, very different. But let's just try and focus on that influence part and keep in contact as well about what you can what you can influence and also what you've been influenced by. So going back to the chat box again, I've seen a few people, which is great, great to hear as well, didn't have a positive experience of PE. That's absolutely fine. We, we, we acknowledge that. But I think you've got a fantastic opportunity now to flip that and break that cycle and give those pupils that you come in contact with a really positive experience. So anything you want to add to that, Ryan, in terms of your views on that? Yeah, it's been, it's been great just to, just to read some of the things that have been, have been flying in on, on the chat box around uh, people's memories. And it certainly you know sparked a few memories of my own. And I put, I put in the chat box at the top around one of my favourite memories at school, something that really engaged me was uh, getting to the, the, the top of the, the climbing rope. Uh, I managed it in year five after after two years of trying and, you know, linking back to last week's webinar and we talked about resilience and that, that's something that, you know, really resonates with me. And for me, it was all about that, that freedom to play and explore. And I remember that, that brilliant feeling when you walked into the hall and all the apparatus were out and you could kind of explore it at your own pace and your own level and, uh, try and you know do things that might have been fit for you but not fit for other members of the class and you know just that that freedom and, and that activity time to do that yeah, and just I think sorry Ryan just on that as well just on the comments box as well Annie's turn has just put something on about her experience at school and how she's turned that into a positive in her adult life to run marathons you know so that's exactly the sort of examples we're talking about in, in terms of you know you've obviously describing a positive experience there but a lot of people have had a not so good experience that have turned that into a positive one as well yeah absolutely and you know during the hour we'll explore different different experiences you know that we've had and and students that we've taught have, have had and, and hopefully you generate that lifelong love of of learning and of sport and of physical activity bro just uh just before we you know go any further i just wanted to you know, back up a few things that I would imagine that the majority of us in the webinar today will, will know already. Um, just with a little bit of academic research, and, and as you can see on your screen, this this research highlights that that pupils are much more likely to succeed in learning if they're if they're interested in what is being taught. You know, probably goes without saying if they enjoy the experience, they're going to be more successful. And on the other hand, you know, the students who are disengaged and frustrated ultimately have less success. And if they don't have that love of that subject, then it's very difficult them to, to, to excel in it and, and achieve in it. And so today we're going to, you know, share ideas and experiences and get your input on, on this topic of engaging pupils in PE. Uh, and like I said, you know, it's been fantastic to see so many uh, people contributing in the, in the chat box already. And that interaction is going to be a theme of the next hour. So on that, on that theme, I'm going to let Paul introduce the first 
poll of the day? Yeah, so just a quick poll, guys, in terms of some research sport England did recently, just to give us an indication of what you think the biggest driver is for physical activity amongst children. So you should be able to see that on your screens now. Just uh, put your vote in there. So what do you think out of those confidence, enjoyment, competence and knowledge when when children were surveyed around this, what, what they what they fed back in terms of their main driver for physical activity? So I can see the poll starting to fill up nicely and there is definitely two areas that are driving here. This enjoyment and confidence. Um, competence is getting a few votes along the way as well. So, yeah, the, the research showed that number one driver for physical activity was enjoyment. And the reason I wanted to draw our attention to that in terms of pupil engagement is I think we need to ensure we keep sight of that. I think as being a former teacher, with all the pressures we have and data and levels and all the things we're trying to meet in terms of external pressures, we lose sight sometimes of the fundamental that enjoyment is going to be the biggest captive for kids. If they enjoy their physical activity, if they enjoy their PE lessons, they're more likely to engage with it, they're more likely then to develop the confidence, they're more likely to develop the competence and they're all, almost, almost likely to build that knowledge bank as well. All four of those were cited, but enjoyment definitely came up on top. And just to, just to add some sort of background to, to what we're doing today. I just want to share a quick video with you around the benefits of PE, just to have in the forefront of our mind as well as we're going along. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted in many instances here with this video, but I think it just encapsulates some of the key principles in terms of the drivers of why we're so, it's so important that we try and positively engage pupils in PE. Our bodies are more or less the same as those of our forefathers the hunter-gatherers. Industrial and technological revolutions happened so fast that our bodies haven't been able to catch up. We live in a world where we can spend all day not moving, and this impacts on our emotional and physical well-being. The Department of Health recommends that children do at least 60 minutes of physical activity every day. But well over half of the UK's children aged between 5 and 15 don't achieve this. As well as influence from the family, teachers and schools have a big part to play in helping children to sit less and move more. Helping them to understand that physical activity is the key to a healthy and successful life. Every living thing is made of billions of cells. Inside each cell are little batteries called mitochondria. These are constantly charging up, ready to be used through physical activity. If we are inactive for too long, the mitochondria get overcharged and this can cause inflammation in the cells. This is thought to be a significant contributor to virtually all long-term conditions. Inflammation can start in children as young as six, so it is absolutely essential to educate and instill good habits for children to be up and active from an early age. Physical activity releases myokines into every cell of the body. These proteins dampen the inflammation. Exercise does so much good for the body and the brain it connects more neurons together to increase brain power. And this improves concentration, creativity and memory. Exercise can even make the brain bigger. The boost of the immune system can last up to six hours. So it's important to exercise regularly. An active school environment directly contributes to better behaviour and improved results. But more importantly, it creates children who move around more, who are healthier, happier, better behaved and more engaged. Active children make strong students. Okay, and just before Ryan progresses on with his part as well, just want to sort of encompass what we mean by enjoyment as well because I think that's a really key principle because enjoyment needs some 
we need to dig into what that actually means. It can be quite a frivolous comment if we just say we want kids to enjoy it. So some factors that we might need to consider as this webinar is going on is things like individual preference, peer behaviour, and also, which, which Ryan's going to touch upon, is about teachers' behaviour as well in terms of their um, relationships and their demeanour with the pupils, which we'll, which we'll dig into a little bit more as the webinar goes on. Yeah, and uh, we're just just reading the chat box there, I've, uh, I've noticed a, a lot of people commenting on, the, on how powerful that video is and, and looking at how they can share it with, with other uh, members of staff in their school. Um, it is uh, going to be available on the handout uh, with the link to that uh, at the end. And I think I've just seen uh, Andy Pugginson as well put a, a link to YouTube on as well. So it is widely available and, you know, really powerful uh, with the messages it, it portrays to get across to other members of staff in your school. And with with some of those those messages from the video in mind, uh, I want to explore how we can use visual hooks and themes to help engage all students and and give them the maximum opportunity to to succeed. I want to start with highlighting the power engagement in PE can, can have on a young person's future and, and that development of lifelong love of learning, sport and being active that we've mentioned. And I've included the pictures on the uh, right hand side of the screen uh, because from the experience I've had. Uh, on a weekly basis, really, over over the last couple of years, uh, and that is when I play when I play five side football uh, with my friends on a on a Sunday night in Middlesbrough, and when we finish at eight o'clock, there's there's a group who who always come and play walking football after us. Now it's honestly no exaggeration to say that, that there's members of that group who are well into the seventies, if not the eighties, but. I would imagine that the reason they are still healthy, sociable and active at that age is because of the positive experiences that they had when they were the age of the children in the, in the pictures on the, on the left-hand side when they were at primary school. And that lifelong love of PE and sport has stayed with them for 60 years. And, and, I, and I think the message is that we have the power right now, you know, in, in, in the school to, to influence whether the children in our care today whether in year one, year four, year six, whatever it is, you know, we have the power to influence whether they're still enjoying the, the sporting experiences and these social experiences in the year 2075, 2080, you know, whenever that might be. And for me personally, you know, seeing those 80 year olds laughing and joking and running around enjoying sport with, with the friends on a Sunday night is, is as good as seeing England win World Cups and, and, and essentially it's it's why we we do what we do as an FAPE unit and this bit of uh this bit of research here on the screen demonstrates how powerful tapping into pupils wider interests can be in engaging them in PE and, and that's really what the, this part of the the workshop is about and with that in mind uh, I'm just going to set you another little poll so thinking of, of students wider interests so in the poll that should be coming up on your screen now what was the most watched kids TV program in the UK in the UK during 2019? So your options are Peppa Pig, SpongeBob, Paw Patrol, or Alvin and the Chipmunks. So testing your knowledge. What are the kids in, in primary schools watching? Let's have a look. Peppa Pig, Paw Patrol, SpongeBob all getting lots of votes. Neck and neck, Peppa Pig and Paw Patrol. So they 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 are actually the top four watched kids TV programs in in twenty nineteen. Uh, the winner in the UK is actually uh, SpongeBob came third in our poll, but um, th those are the the top four. So you know they're the things that the kids you know at primary school are watching when 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 they're not at school. Obviously, other things as well, but they're the top four that came out. And the reason I've asked you that question is, you know, can we use some of those interests, whether it is SpongeBob, Peppa Pig, Spider-Man, Ariana Grande, Steph Horton, whatever it is, can we use those hooks and interests that they have outside of school to, um, to engage them in PE? And, and for me, this box on, on the right hand side of, the, of your screen now is what PE in primary is all about. You know, can PE be a break from reality whilst helping to develop the skills for reality and you can see Ben our, our colleague from the from the FA PE unit in the picture there he's setting a fantasy scenario to engage the pupils 
And as far as they're concerned, they're, they're going to be astronauts in their spaceships, uh, avoiding aliens and, and getting to as many planets as they can. However, at the bo in the bottom box, I've, I've just put some of the skills from the national curriculum and beyond that, that they're actually going to be developing, probably without, without the kids even realising it. You know, think, things like agility, you know, changing speed, changing direction to get past the aliens. It might be that they're carrying a ball or bouncing a ball or dribbling a football and using coordination skills, the running and the jumping to get from one planet to the other, developing attacking skills to get past those aliens. You can see uh, Ben's got them in little teams. So that element of teamwork and that holistic uh, development around communication, the social side, the hundreds of decisions they're going to make in, in that game, um, as well as the resilience if things aren't going going right straight away. All these things we're developing, the kids probably don't know that, but these are all the things we might, in our medium-term plan, concentrate on one or two of these elements to focus on for that half term. Uh, and this links nicely with uh, the games-based approach and, and games-based learning that uh, Paul's going to come on to later on in the webinar. And this uh, this is another example uh, I used recently with a with a year two class in Middlesbrough. And again, as far as far as the pupils were concerned, they were just going to be little lion cubs. Uh, avoiding the hyenas to get from one side of the desert to the other. Um, but my objective as the teacher was the one at the bottom of the screen. You know, can we use agility to beat a defender in a competitive game? Now, the year two pupils I was working with don't need to know about that objective I derived from the national curriculum. But if their parents asked, were to ask them what they've done in PE today, they're probably much more likely to be able to tell them that they were looking for hyenas and trying to run past them and trying to avoid them. And, you know, using that little hook is something that hopefully will, will make these things stick uh, and things like this can be can be really uh really powerful particularly with key stage one and and at the start of this lesson um as the pupils were coming out uh, out to the playground i had you can see the little lion uh little lion toy there in the picture and i'd hidden that in, in my kit bag and i downloaded a lion raw sound effect on my phone so as they were coming out you know he was coming out of the speaker this lion roaring and straight away it hooked the kids in because they you know they were looking around and you know where's that noise coming from and you know it, it was a hook to get them in straight away and uh, to give you another example this is um something i saw on twitter recently from it's actually from um a football academy in america but they uh, the, the work with primary school age students as you can see and you know, this this football academy, Riverhounds in Pittsburgh, uh, really engaged with a hook, and as you'll see in the video. So once the webinar finishes at five o'clock and you've watched the chase, then you need to get on the phone to your head teachers and ask them for some uh, dinosaur outfits. Um, but, you know, not, not just to do that, but, you know, it does highlight and I think it's a great, um, great highlight in how those visual hooks can really engage the pupils. And I, I think it would be great at this stage if if anybody has got anything that they'd like to share in the chat box around particular hooks that might have worked with your class that you teach and what age group that was with and little things that, that really engaged them in PE. And if, if people have got some ideas that have really worked, it'd be great in, in, to share those in the chat box now. So I've just put a little, a little checklist here, really, um, regarding some of the areas we've talked about so far. And, you know, that enjoyment and that fun is something that we, we, we've talked about all along. You know, does, is your lesson fun, I think? Other than safety, that's that's got to be our primary concern, isn't it? Is what we're delivering fun? Do the kids want to engage with it? Does it include some personal interests, whether it's TV programs or or things that they're watching? Has it got that element of fantasy while all the time being a break from reality, but helping them with skills for reality? Uh, and of course, all these things meeting the different needs of, of the class of 30 that you've got in front of you. And I think these pictures demonstrate that even if you are one of the best footballers in the world these things are still applicable when it comes to learning you know whether you're Raheem Sterling with that that toy chicken there or 
or Ellen White or Jesse Lingard on the unicorns or, or it's your year three class. All of these things, you, you know, are vital when it comes to learning. And I think this links nicely with this quote and, and one that I think we can resonate with no matter what age for, for Maya Angelou. You know, you can only become truly accomplished at something that you love. And a couple of examples, just, you know, a couple of stories from my own personal experience. Um, firstly, when I, when I first started teaching, which was, what, about 10 or 12 years ago now, and uh, my first school in York, I had a, a pupil who was really disengaged with PE. I'm sure we've all come across this, this type of student, didn't bring the kit, uh, refused to take part, was disruptive. And I tried everything with him, but nothing seemed to work. And then just by chance, one day he, he happened to overhear uh, myself and another teacher talking about my dad going fishing. Um, now, I, I haven't got the first clue about fishing, <laughs> but my dad loves it. And I just happened to be telling a colleague about, about my dad going fishing all the time. And anyway, this, this disengaged pupil just happened to be the keenest fisherman you've ever known. And from that day, every time he saw me from, from going from not speaking to me, he just wanted a conversation about fishing and, you know, what what trout my dad had been catching and, and which bait he'd recommend him using. And now I know, like I said, know nothing about fishing. I had to keep looking things up to, to talk to him about. But from that day, we, we just clicked and, you know, I started just putting fishing themes on the, on the PE lessons. So the games that we were playing in PE were about catching fish or avoiding stingrays and, you know, he, he, he absolutely loved it and it really did transform his engagement in PE. And I know it's an extreme example, but one that demonstrates the power these little things can have. And I think, again, you know, like I said, I would imagine the majority of people who are joining us today have had those experiences of those really disengaged students. And it would be great if, if people would share in the chat box anything, any success stories and, and how you kind of, they went from that to being really engaged in PE. And, and from my own experience as a pupil, I remember my parents and, and teachers trying desperately for months to get me to read. And I had, I had no interest in it. I just wanted to be outside playing football. And then one day my dad was sorting the loft out and I found his old Match of the Day annual. It was 1982 edition. Trevor Francis on the front, still remember it to this day. And I read it cover to cover over and over again. And, and from then on, I'd, I'd read anything if it had something to do with football, you know, similar to the girls in, in the picture there. And I still enjoy reading to this day because of that hook that got me in there at a young age. And I've put, I've put this question on there because um, myself and Paul put a tweet out earlier in the week um, building up to this webinar about engaging uh, pupils in the learning. And we, and we had some great responses. And um, one of the things that came up was visual tools to engage them, uh, students in primary school, while they're getting changed and, and before the lesson. And I, and I thought there were some great points on that. And a couple of ideas I've seen um, up in the northeast in my region. I've seen a teacher in Newcastle having a game of hangman on the board, which uh, and the answer to, to the hangman uh, puzzle was was the PE learning objective for that day. And the pupils had to had to try and guess what, what letters were and what the objective were uh, was. But you know, they could win house points, but they could only they could only play the game of hangman if they were if they were changed and ready for PE. So straight away, you know, they were hooked. In, in this game, but it also increased the activity time of the actual practical session because they were getting ready really quickly. Uh, another te uh, teacher I've worked with in Middlesbrough is, is a visual league table on the wall and students get points and move up and down the league depending on how quickly their whole table get changed and ready for PE. And I think that links nicely with, uh, for those who joined us last week, around that uh, holistic development. And, you know, straight away in the lesson, they were they were working as teams, communicating social skills uh, to try and help each other to get changed. And that particular class, it was a year one class, went from taking 28 minutes to get changed to, to just over 10 minutes because they were working as a team to help each other out and do that. And I, I've also liked, you know, having a video playing while they're getting changed, which might link prior and future learning. And again, if you've got any strategies for engaging students, um, in the build-up to PE lessons, if you want to drop those in the chat box. And, and finally, just to, you know, with regarding visual engagement, I don't think this can be underestimated, which is the power of, the power of having strong, positive, visible role models. Um, uh, whether it's incorporating Dean Arash Smith, Andy Murray, Jaden Sancho into the lesson objective or uh, you, you're planning or having the pictures of them on the classroom. 
you know, they can be really inspirational and motivational for the students and, and seeing those role models. But I think for me, the biggest role model of, of them all is, is you, the teacher, and, and this picture on the right hand side. And I don't think we can underestimate the power of being a PE role model. And I think the main element to that is actually being in PE kit, being in track suit, um, as opposed to delivering in, in a suit or a skirt, for example. And I, I know having been a teacher for, for, for 10 years, it takes it takes time to get changed during the day and it can sometimes be a bit of a hassle. But I think it really demonstrates if you're in a track suit and you're ready for PE, you know, it demonstrates the pupil, the value you see in that PE lesson. And, and I think that itself in it can be the first step in terms of engaging the pupils. So with role models in mind, our next poll is this one. So a uh, recent survey of primary school children, which, who did they choose as their biggest hero? Harry Potter, Ariana Grande, Lionel Messi or Matilda? So primary school age children, who did they, who did they vote as their biggest hero? Poor Matilda hasn't had any votes yet. Oh, there we go, one. <laughs> Lionel Messi's winning at the moment. Harry Potter storming back. Well, I think Lionel Messi's just won our poll. Um, this, you know, they were actually the top four that were voted as, as primary school's heroes. Uh, and this, like I said, this is a very recent poll. So Matilda, Lionel Messi, Ariana Grande, uh, and Harry Potter. Harry Potter actually came out on top uh, across the survey of both boys and girls. Um, so again, you know, if they're the things that they're interested in, they're, they're the, the characters or the people they say as heroes, can we start to maybe incorporate those into the lessons? And, you know, can we use those as the, those little hooks in PE? Um, I can see, you know, just from the chat box, there's, there's been so much correspondence and, and ideas and people sharing things, which is fantastic. So I think it'd be a good opportunity to bring Mark and Chris in just to have a little review and uh, a little chat about some of the things that have been coming in. Thanks, Ryan. And uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, the chat box is going a little bit crazy. It's uh, impossible to keep up with everything, but there's a couple of themes that would be worth picking up. Um, one about... Uh, linking your PE topic to uh, your PE activity to your topic work in your class. So Margaret Hughes has uh, mentioned that. Jessica Muir is using the Rivers topic to teach movement. Kimberly Yates, dance related to World War II topic they were doing in their classroom. Um, two key stage one teachers, Sharon Key and Louise Robinson, talking about going on a bear hunt, that lovely kids book for key stage one and um, bringing some of the movement out and the adventure of that book in, in PE could be really exciting. Um, Charlotte Rawlings, um, Key Stage 2 example of the uh, Greek Olympics. Um, there, there's others in there, but I think it's really important to think that PE isn't in isolation of all the other things that are happening for those children at school. Um, and if we can link it in, we might actually, that, that's your hook. Um, if you if you can't think of maybe the poor patrol example, for example. So um, the other thing, looking at reluctant pupils um, and going back to the initial question that we asked at the beginning, your favourite moments in PE, um, John Creeth, Helen Rance, Amy Stevens all mentioned it was about being with their friends. Um, so I'm going to bring Chris in here with a question. Um, I haven't teed you up on this, Chris, so it's a bit of a big one. But um, if, if we know that children want to be with their friends and for them that's what engagement's about, why, why in PE then do we sort of, group them how we think they should be grouped and we we pair them up and we we sometimes stop them being with their friends um, throughout most of the school day um, why do we do that what's the advantage in letting them choose and what's the advantage in in us choosing I think there's uh discussions and, and viewpoints for and against this um I think from my perspective I think we've got to acknowledge pupils perspectives and feelings we've got to try and buy them into the rationale of the lesson uh, but what I find quite a lot is that the practice design that we do sometimes is superimposed uh, on all pupils. Um, so if the activity challenge point is quite high, um, those who potentially may be strong physically, technically, maybe dominate that practice. Um, and then sometimes other people struggle. So I think the use of parallel activities to try and uh, find the right start point and challenge point for the pupils is key. Um, to give everybody access to the lesson, to give everybody the chance to uh, get success. And then I think sometimes there is a place sometimes for, um, let's say, for example, you've got a, a couple of girls or you've got a couple of boys that are, 
are really strong within the physical and technical corner that we refer to within the FA about our, our four corner model, uh, physical, technical, psychological and social. And, and if pupils, boys or girls are really strong in that physical or technical side uh, and they are paired together, um, maybe they need a challenge point playing against somebody of a, of a similar um, ability or potentially we could ban them against playing in a, an underloaded or an overloaded game um, to potentially uh, try and stretch them that way. So um, maybe play one against a two. So um, somebody who's striving ahead in the physical corner might play against a two and, and try and get that, that challenge point there. And, and likewise, play the other way around sometimes in, in terms of, um, you know, playing uh, two who maybe coping, uh, you know, play them against some uh, a, a striver and just see how that challenge point can be affected. So, Lots of good discussions for and against that, but um, I think for us, sometimes practice design that meets the needs of the pupils uh, and their start and challenge point uh, is really, really key for us uh, to make sure that all are engaged and not just some. Okay. Uh, just to finish up there, um, before we pass back over to, to Paul and Ryan, um, Chris, you mentioned parallel activities. We're going to be looking at that next week, aren't we? So we'll park that for next week, but that's something to look forward to if you want to know more about that. Make sure you, you join us for, for team teaching next week. Yeah. Brilliant, guys. Thank you. Um, I've just seen, uh, sorry, Paul. I've just seen uh, from a comment there, one from uh, Michelle around that she introduced Harry Potter football into their school. I'd love to find out more about that. Michelle sounds brilliant <laughs> and really engaged the kids. So look forward to hearing more about that. Brilliant. I just want to pick up on a couple of things myself. Uh, one of the things that I've got a bit of a bugbear about is, and a few people mentioned it, is changing. And what we do need to recognise is positive engagement relies on us removing as many barriers as we possibly can. And I've just had a flick through some of the comments and there's some for and against around changing. There's some people that said that the kids come in their kit for the full day. There's some that have argued that children need to be able to change and learn how to do that, which I agree upon. But we've got to think about particularly as we get to year six, things like body image and, and those types of things as well. You know, what is the best practice now around PK? Let me put this to you. My son is in year four three at the back of this right he's in year four at the moment and he takes his peak kit to school at the beginning of the term and it doesn't come back to the end of the term so we talk about health and hygiene i i would suspect that there's a health and hygiene thing with him having his kit in his bag for the full six weeks so would it be better the kids coming in the kit the kids need to get changed for every single physical activity and every single PE lesson we do question mark i don't think they necessarily do and i think sometimes that could be a barrier one of the particular barriers that it can lead towards is maximising activity time. So if we think about a lesson's timetable for 60 minutes, an average PE lesson from our research is around 36 minutes by the time we've had change in either side and getting into the gym. So if they've only got 36 minutes of activity time, we need to make the most of that within that time. But I think we can also expand that by perhaps thinking about the changing aspects as well. We've obviously got some challenges moving forward as people putting on around the social distancing aspects and things like that as well. So... You know, there's some things for us to be thinking about along those sides. Schemes just, are... uh, just on just on kit there as well, Paul. Yeah. That's that's the uh, sparks a, mem a memory of my own actually. And for whatever reason, this was secondary school rather than primary. But for for some reason, my my secondary school in year seven and eight, you had to wear. Do you remember those really old old school football shorts that were really really short? Yeah, and, and like a flimsy material. And then for whatever reason, once you got to year nine, you got you could wear like longer length shorts and and baggier shorts, and you could wear a tracksuit top. And I don't I don't know what the reason behind that was, but I remember vividly, you know, when you were in year eight, you were really looking forward to being in year nine because you could actually wear, you know, some more appropriate kit and, and kit yeah. that you felt comfortable in. And I don't think we can underestimate those little things and, and in terms of engaging the students or disengaging them with, with things like that. Yeah, definitely. And I think just from the schools, I'd be interested as well, just from the teachers that are putting in around their pupils coming to school, in PE for the full day. I'd be interested to hear what the impact of that is in their schools as well, because I do feel that it raised the stand, raised the profile of PE as well when you've got when you see pupils walking around in PE kit. I also have this debate as well around playtime and lunchtime, around warm-ups. When we talk about warm-ups for five and six year olds, I never in the history of me pulling the blinds back in the staff room and looking out on the playground have I seen a kid doing a quad stretch and holding the quad or in their arm. They just get straight into play. So we've got to think about what do we do in a P lesson and why do we do it? You know, for example, those types of stretches at five and six year old aren't required. The kids don't need that. The flexibility is enhanced at that age. The, the flexibility doesn't decline till the end of key stage two. So we just need to be thinking about why we do what we do. Is it because we've seen it before? What are our influences? I know I've gone off on a tangent there. Um, so just going on to learning through games then, which we'll flip on to now. 
just some content around this really in terms of what games are. So I've started with a pound coin on there because hopefully this resonates with a few of you on the uh, on the call as well. As if I had a pound coin for every time a pupil asked me, sir, sir, we're going to have a game today. We're having a game today, sir. I'd literally be a multi, multi-millionaire. I'd be sat in the Bahamas doing this call. So we know that kids positively engage with games. We know that we can work across the four corners as well and, and really encapsulate all that holistic development. So when I talk about the four corners, for those people that haven't seen that before, that's an FA approach to how we deliver PE and, 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 and football in particular. So technical aspects, physical, the psychological aspects and the social aspects leads to that holistic development and games can often help us do that. It can also be a fantastic behaviour management tool as well. So being able to start with the game actually engages the children quicker and is a really good entry point to the lesson as well. And I've put on there a little image of Generation Z. You know, we are working with a different generation of children now that are engaged in different things and as Ryan's alluded to, different hooks and different activities that we need to align to. And we see some fantastic practice up and down the country when we go into schools and watch coaches and teachers deliver. We see some great practice around that. So just some food for thought around the game. So just in the just in the chat box, what I'd like you to do is just define a game for me. If you were to encapsulate a game, what would it be? What would be the components of a game? What would you be? What would you see in that game? So just drop your thoughts in the comment box. What defines what defines a game? So we've got teamwork from Anna, directional from Andrew. Alexandra's talked about rules, Marcus competition. Hazel talked about rules again. Fun's come up a couple of times. Challenge, brilliant. Lisa's talked about fun. Fun agility and teamwork, fantastic. We'll keep them coming in. Super. Okay. So let's just let's just drill down. Let's have a look at some of the components of what a game actually is and what we mean by a game. So I'm not going to go through these individually. What I do want to say from the outset is within structuring a game and with us us delivering a game in a peer lesson, we can dial up and dial down some of these components so we can have more competition and less competition and that can have certain impacts on the game itself. A game isn't just one ball and two goals or a a netball type game. A game can be TIG, a game can be something that uses the imagination, that uses the hooks that Ryan's talked about. It needs to make sure when when we plan a game, that it has got a specific goal and outcome. What I often see when I observe um, lessons in in schools is that the goal and outcome can be too broad for PE. So, for example, it might be today we are working on attacking within a game situation. Attacking is a quite quite broad uh, terminology. We need to be really specific over what we want the kids to work towards. Talk about safety on there as a component of a game as well. So that's not just physical safety. We need to ensure the psychological safety there as well. We're going to look at how that can be done today and in next week's webinar as well, how you can create that safety net for the pupils where they feel comfortable accessing the lesson at a level they're comfortable with and accessing the game at a level they're comfortable with. So as I've said with rules as well, if we put too many rules into the game, that can lose some autonomy for the kids and can lose some differentiation. If we put not enough rules in, then obviously that can lead to a little bit too much chaotic uh, nature of the game. Interactions is important within the games. Again, that's teacher and pupil interaction, but also interactions between the pupils themselves, problem solving, giving them things to to discuss during the games, giving them little prompts. And that exploration factor as well during a game is really crucial to be able to develop a holistic element of the pupil. So just some considerations for you to think about in terms of intrinsic motivation. What do we need to do in terms of lesson design? One thing I do want to pick up from this is something I just made a note of earlier is around schemes of work and lesson plans. And I think we'll all agree that, you know, we're pushed in terms of time as professionals to plan to the nth degree in terms of what a lesson is going to look like. I would argue, and I think we would argue as a group and as an organisation, that not necessarily for a six-week block of work do you need six lesson plans. Let me just repeat that again. So not necessarily do you need six lesson plans for six lessons in a block of work. Lesson plan may and usually should span more than one lesson. Okay, I would argue that working on agility for one lesson will not be enough time to develop long-term muscle memory, to develop the kids' long-term memory. You could argue, arguably plan just two or three lessons for a six-week block of work because we'll be dipping in and out of certain activities and being flexible. Schemes of work are fantastic, but there is no way that you can predict for what you're going to do in week six 
before you've delivered to the, the to, to the class. It's just an impossibility. Things are going to happen. We're going to have to alter things. We're going to have to work around things. So that's really important that we think about that. So intrinsic motivation, going back to the point, we need to create some autonomy for the kids. So some pupil-centered approach, how we're going to get them to buy into things. Us as adults, you'll know if a new initiative is brought into school and we've had, we've had some input into that, we feel like we're more bought into it. That's as important for kids as well. Competence is really important. We need to be able to make the kids feel confident and competent in what they're doing. And that takes time. And then we need to make sure that it's relatable. One of the things I couldn't relate to when I was at school was algebra. I could not relate to it. And I think if I could have related to it, I would have been a little bit more intrinsically motivated to be able to access that type of work. So the quote there, teachers who are more flexible, teachers who are often more choice, teachers who are often more self-initiative for the pupils tend to lead to greater engagement within the lessons. So two lessons going on the left-hand side here. It's a, sorry, two pictures going on in the same lesson on the left-hand side of this image. It's exactly the same lesson. It's an invasion game lesson. The game that the kids are playing in those two pictures is a game called width to win. So basically, when you've got the ball, you have to play the ball to the outside of the pitch before you can score. Now, the teacher, is diff Amanda in this case, has differentiated this lesson so that the top players are playing with ball in hands. That's the level that they're ready to access invasion games at. But you notice at the bottom, the bottom group are playing ball at feet. So the teacher has cleverly just differentiated the game slightly. We're all working on invasion games. We're all working on width to win is the focus, which is a principle of attacking, but we're working on it a slightly different way. And Amanda's actually in the second picture, on the third picture rather on the right-hand side, is looking at how she can shape the groups. So again, peer groups, we sometimes veer away from them for behaviour management, which is fine. But sometimes those are a really effective way of engaging pupils initially before then we can start maybe being a little bit more careful and a little bit more tact tactical with our groupings, okay? So just some considerations around that. And as we've alluded to already, the role of the teacher is absolutely pivotal, okay? The, the, in terms of the relationships, in terms of being able to have those conversations, in terms of being able to build rapport. And what games allows us to do as well is prevent whole group stops, which eat into lesson time. So if you picture a peer lesson where we're asking all the group to come back in, sit down, be quiet, stop picking the grass, stop picking your nose. We've all of a sudden eaten about five or six minutes away from people coming in. We can actually almost set up four different games or four small games going on and we can rotate ourselves and facilitate those games and keep that activity level going and then maybe just have conversations like we would do in a literacy or numeracy lesson with a small table at a time without making those whole group stops. So just a little, little uh, trick of the trade there. So I'm going to just show uh, or share a quick video with you. As the video is playing, just have a think about what Amanda's doing in the video to, to manage the difference, to uh, consider individual needs and how she's progressing the lesson and how also she creates some autonomy within the lesson as well. Arm tennis, key stage two, national curriculum. Enjoy communicating, collaborating and competing with each other. We are learning to create our own collaborative or competitive game. The teacher, Amanda, begins a session by demonstrating the game with one of the pupils. We're going to play a little bit of arm tennis. You're going to get one of our bibs out of our bags and you're going to hold it with your partner. You're going to get one ball and you can choose whether you want to get a football, a tennis ball or a soft squidgy ball. The decision is yours. OK, so we're going to bounce the ball, catch it, throw it over, catch it. Good girl, amazing. Bounce the ball, bounce it on the floor. Good. Catch. Okay, now you can make the decision whether you work together with your partner or whether you work in competition. Off we go. So you can play it a little bit more like volleyball, keep it moving a little bit more. Yeah, good. Try to move the ball a little bit quicker, boys. A little bit quicker, a little bit quicker. Yes, good. The teacher works with the children to help them understand the importance of listening to each other's ideas, taking turns, sharing equipment and playing fairly. Are we keeping score or working together? Working together? Good. How many are you up to? <laughs> Can you do it while moving that direction? Yeah, good. Amanda encourages the pupils to adapt and develop their games by devising new rules and introducing additional equipment. I'm going to challenge you, can you play with a tennis ball instead of the football? OK, there you go. Thank you very much. 
Amazing, great work, well done. Okay, so that's gonna be like your target area in between the two. Fab, let's try that then. So we've been playing with our feet. Okay, off we go then. What can we do with it? Hey, love it, well done. Good. Oh, what a great game that is. I really like that one, well done. So we've got two pieces of equipment going at the same time. Really like that, well done. Let's see it in action. Real. To encourage communication, each member of the class switches partners so they can share their games with the other pupils. Okay, so some great comments coming up on the on the box there. Just um, just some reflections from me. I think one thing that struck me about the video was, let's say there's 26 pupils in the class there. By the end of that five or six minutes, there was probably 13, almost 13 different activities going on, 13 different lessons, a lot of them which had been self-differentiated by the, by the pupils themselves. But then there'd also been some facilitating of the teacher going around and just maybe prompting them in terms of rates of progress. So a really good video there, and Chris is going to delve into that a little bit. But just before I sort of sign off, just a little quote in terms of some of the stuff we've been talking about, about role of the teacher. And this is from a, a book called Kids Deserve It, and Chris will put a, a little link in, into the comments box around this as well. So the quote is this, kids deserve an excited adult. They need someone who's ready to explore and laugh with them. Kids often have far more issues to deal with than we realise. School is their safety net. They need us to surround them with love, encouragement and hope. And I think in this period of time as well, a lot of people said this is a real pivotal time for us to be able to go back to school with this renewed focus around P and sport. Yes, there's going to be certain challenges with what we're facing at the moment, but I do think we've got an unbelievable opportunity now to shape the future of P and sport for good. And I think we've got, you know, we've seen the home stuff that's going on. We've seen the home learning that's going on. Listen to Ben Shepherd on Radio 5 yesterday talking about his experience of homeschooling, how challenging he's finding that and how much he, he recognises the role that teachers play in terms of pupil engagement is massive. And going back to the most successful home lesson that I've led in this sort of period of time, uh, about a mile away from my house is a field and, and random for the farmers bought two alpacas. And you know what an alpaca is, basically it's a... It's an upgraded llama, let's put it that way. Anyway, my two kids saw the alpacas on the walk and we came back home and they wanted to do a lesson around the alpacas. It was autonomous, it was pupil-centred and they did lesson. I lose that. I use that term loosely. But the impact and the... I even had my son sat down for more than two minutes. Lockdown. You know, it just shows in terms of that pupil-centred approach, that pupil engagement, uh, how we can maximise that. So I'll pass over to Mark and Chris to pick up any other, uh, any other sort of questions that have been appearing on the box yeah some uh thanks guys some really fantastic insights there um just sort of like uh i've seen louise ellis erin wilkinson john feel and emma reed ross wilson talking about differentiation and choice on them and a lot of comments being directed towards that activity that we've just seen there from amanda um i think i think it's also crucial about when we focus on the topic of today of engaging pupils in pe um, I also think it's about what lens we look at when we're looking at that activity. So did we just see physical and technical things going on in there? Or actually, did we hone in on the social side of engaging pupils in PE there? So a question for, for, for Mark, why is communication, collaboration and cooperation so key in terms of engaging pupils in PE from a social perspective uh, and a psychological arm over and above just maybe focusing on the physical and technical arm of, of maybe what we saw just in that video? Yeah, it's a good question um, and really relevant because it builds from from last week's uh, webinar on holistic development. I think children at play um, will use those skills. When they go out in their lunch break, that's what they are, the skills they'll use. Some of them will move a lot and some of them will move well, others won't, but they'll all use those skills continually. So if you go back to a slide Ryan showed earlier where he, he was talking about his Sunday nights and, and the group that came on after him, um, the group of older people playing, um, physically and technically they're going to be quite different from what they were when they were 10 years old or even 30 years old but those social skills are what keep them there so so i use the story of i have a friend um who came down from manchester to live in london um, and he was a big cyclist cycling was what he did um he wasn't brilliant at cycling physically and technically he, he wasn't like you know 
sort of France level, but he was he was good at doing it. He wanted to carry on doing it, but he didn't have anyone to cycle with in London. He was one of these people who go in those groups of bikes that you see going around. So he had to go and join a bike club and he had to make friends. He had to convince someone that they were going to go past his house, pick him up on the route, and he had to sort out if they were going too fast or too slow for him to join in and carry on being physically active. So if you think of the skills needed, yes, there's some physical and technical stuff, but actually if we think about phys- PE as, as, as being the... The, the start of lifelong participation in movement, those three C's, um, and especially that communication part, are absolutely crucial. Um, we, we allow it and we, we encourage it in numeracy and literacy, but I think PE brings out a different type of communication and a different type of competition and collaboration. Fantastic. What I've done is I've just copied the words there into the chat box. They should enjoy communicating, collaborating and competing with each other. So I think probably some of the key messages that I've seen from the fantastic comments is we're starting to see this from a physical, a technical, a psychological and a social arm in terms of really unpicking the topic of engaging pupils in PE. So well done to everybody who's commented in the boxes and, uh, you know, some fantastic insights that you're starting to see this from an holistic point of view. Um, and that's just been fantastic to see. So uh, think, hand, uh, over to, hand over think, to Ryan. Uh, yeah, I think another thing to mention as well, uh, Chris, to link in with, with some of the discussions we had last week for those who, who joined us, um, were around this the, the non-sport specific curriculums as well. And, you know, those those of us who've, who've seen the national curriculum and, and know it will know that, you know, the curriculum lends itself to fundamental movement skills and attacking and defending skills as opposed to blocks of sports. And I think just thinking back to that video, you know, they were all working on the same objective of improving coordination skills as well as those social skills and those communication skills. But even though they were all working to that objective, you know, we saw some of them were using hands, some of them were using um, a ball, uh, a football in hand, some of them were using a tennis ball, but then others were using uh, the feet and, and being footballers. So we might have had some basketballers, some netballers, some footballers, all these things going on in the same lesson. And I think, you know, that links in with the, the differentiation piece, which I know we're going to do more work on in, in future weeks. Um, just, but, can I just jump in there? Sorry. Yeah, of course, can you? Uh, Mark, just in terms of, we've got quite a few people saying about um, resources, lesson ideas. Do we want to point people in direction in terms of that would be best to access in terms of what we recommend? Put your spot there, mate. <laughs> We, we will do. I think the best thing to do in terms of um, keeping us keeping in touch with us at the moment, um, it's obviously that it's crept up on us this lockdown, and we, we're as a team working out how we best communicate our ideas to to affect and, and help and support people like you. So at the moment, the way we're doing that is through our Twitter handle, which will come up in a couple of slides' time. Um, we will put resources on there. Chris has just added it to the chat box. If you even if you you're not new to Twitter, just you can you can always without account just uh, uh, go on and search for it anyway. And we'll add resources. We will. Um, we've got two more of these uh, webinars coming up, and beyond that, after the half term break, um, we'll we'll be reviewing what we do next. But there are lots of resources that we would recommend, and that's probably how we'll get them um, over to people. Yeah, just in terms of um, fall as well when we do get back to school there is opportunity for cpd within schools as well um, and your, your local football club can manage that for you so a lot of fo- local football clubs are working with ourselves to be able to provide cpd in schools so that's another opportunity when we do get back to normality to make an inquiry and uh, just to you know just to start to wrap things up because i am conscious that the chase does start in two minutes and paul's promised you you'll be uh you'll be on that <laughs> um, so we need to get them back up <laughs> Um, I've made available now in the ha- in the handouts to download uh, the certificate of attendance, um, your the, the presentation. So there's a slide deck that we've used today, so you can go back in and start to review things, and also a reference list uh, to uh, the the things that the bits of research and, and videos that we've used today. And um, also in there is a, it's a teacher survey. If you didn't manage to complete the survey while you're in the waiting room, or uh, if when if you were on last week's webinar then it'd be uh, fantastic if you could do that just so we can start to shape our our, our ongoing cpd and tailor it towards uh, the needs of uh, of the learners uh, of you guys who have joined us um ju- just to start to wrap things up then and these you know we'd say were our key tips that we've talked about today in terms of engaging those pupils in pe and making the lesson fun like we've talked about right from minute one 
and you know alongside that ensuring that the lesson manages the learner difference and we're going to do lots more work on that going forward in terms of our cpd together um active learning time through those games that that paul delved into incorporating the pupils interests as a hook and and you know one of the most important things of, of being that pe role model um which again we can't uh, underestimate the power of that and just to go back to uh, the, those three questions that, that Paul posed to you at the start. So hopefully in the last hour, you know, you have had things that, that have been confirmed, you know, things think, yes, I, I'm, I'm doing that right, you know, um, which is brilliant. Hopefully you've got a few things, maybe some more questions for us. Want to challenge us around some of the things that we've said, which we would absolutely invite and, and really encourage you to do that. And fingers crossed. There's one or two things which has made you curious and want to delve into a little bit further, and hopefully the handouts that uh, you, that are available to download will give you some avenues to explore around that. I'm just going to point you in the in the direction of uh, the the FA Boot Room, which is uh, our FA Learning website, which has got a variety of, of resources, and we've got a, a, an FA Primary Teachers Award page on there. So again, if, if post webinar, if you if you want to go and uh, have a look at that and find out a little bit more about the Primary Teachers Award, and I know we've got quite a few teachers who joined us this afternoon who, who've done that and point you in the direction of the next uh, next two weeks so Mark and Chris will be will be leading to uh, next week's session around team teaching and PE uh, which will be same time uh, same place ne next Thursday and uh, there'll be links to sign up uh, via the FAP unit uh, Twitter handle there and via the avenues that, that you've signed up today and just just to, just to finish uh, 501 apologies we've missed the first 30 seconds but just to, uh just to, again just to say a massive uh thank you uh, if you have got any further questions please do direct them to us via via our twitter handle and we appreciate you know how difficult it is probably for a lot of you with kids running about and, and people you've got to care for at this difficult time and we really do appreciate your, your engagement in in what we're doing and all your contributions to the webinar today and and, and for joining us each week so, so thank you very much yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Stay safe.